Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us. Welcome to AdAge Remotely. I'm Janine Poggi, Senior Editor at AdAge. And today I am live with Sir Martin Sorrell, Executive Chairman of S4 Capital and founder of WPP. Hi, Martin. How are you? I'm well, Janine. How are you? I'm here with my little friend. I uh, my see little that. Bron bronze monk. My bronze monk. Where are you working from? Uh, I'm working from from home here in London, in the centre of London. Uh, we're we're still in mandatory lockdown. I'm, I'm at the end of my fourth week. I'm not going stir crazy, Janine. I'm, uh, I'm I, I wouldn't say I'm enjoying it. Um, it's not bad. Uh, it's not the way I want to spend the rest of my working life. But uh, it's very efficient. I can have. You know, I can wear my pajamas as I am now, and I can uh, be interviewed by by you. I don't have to go to a, a studio or or the office. So actually, it works. No lunches, no breakfast, no dinners. It's uh, it's full on from eight in the morning till last night until eleven o'clock at night, and tonight it'll be until about six or seven in the evening. Uh, so it's it's uh, it works very well, and we we can reach clients. Clients are accessible. Uh, reach our people much more easily so it has its advantages as well as its disadvantages but i i must say uh, i'll look forward to getting back to the office our landlord actually uh, deactivated the fobs for entry into our <laughs> office despite the fact we continue to pay rent so we'll have to do something we'll have to do something about that shortly you're not going back there anytime soon anyway right now <laughs> Um, well, I think the government has said the lockdown here in the UK will last for another three weeks at least. Uh, I was talking to our colleagues uh, on, a, on a call just before, and in Australia, I think the government are talking about May the 11th uh, as, to a, as, as to a withdrawal of some of the lockdown requirements. So I think the world will start to come out of this from a lockdown point of view, maybe mildly, but as we get into May, mid-May, uh, and into June. Yeah, I uh, I am enjoying your your background right now. Can you tell us what's uh, what's <laughs> behind you? So this is my uh, my study, <laughs> and I've got uh, I've got some cartoons from uh, from before. I could take you on a guided tour, but that would be as I I can sit here all day looking at myself. It's wonderful, and, and my your, dad in the background, and my little my little bronze friend, which uh, Wesley Tahar and Victor Knapp gave me as my to remind me of my 75th birthday. Happy belated birthday. A, 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 gentle, a gentle nudge from them. <laughs> What's your favorite uh, cartoon that you have back over there? Um, well, the favorite one actually is probably this one, little one here. Um, it's, um, it's one when, when David Ogilvy uh, famously called me an odious little shit. Um, I don't know whether you have to X that out. The Financial <laughs> Times, the Financial Times in those days didn't put in four-letter words, so they called me an odious little jerk. And we, we put OLJ into our annual report. We did a little cartoon on the back of uh, our annual report with me as OLJ. So there we are. So that's probably one of the favorites, but there are plenty around here. Plenty okay. would, cause, would cause palpitations or mirth or a mixture of the two elsewhere. I'm here with Sir Martin Sorrell, and if you have any questions or comments, please feel free to leave them on our social channels, and we'll try to incorporate them into the conversation. So, you know, it's great having you on because you obviously have a very uh, global outlook on what's been happening. Um, but can you speak to what the climate is in the UK right now, and how do you see it comparing to what we've seen here in the the US market? Well, obviously, I, 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 I decamped from the U.S. about five weeks ago. My last trip was to Stockholm, actually, with a Google event in, in Stockholm. And I haven't been on the road uh, for some sub substantial period of time. So this is all reported speech, apart from the U.K. U.K., obviously, uh, U.K. is in lockdown. Uh, I don't think people are generally happy about it. Our prime minister, of course, was uh, in uh, in a hospital in the the uh, the s serious illness unit for a, a significant period of time and is now recouping and will take a month to come back so this is this is hit home very much in the country the nhs workers the doctors and the nurses are doing a superb job and 
at eight o'clock last night, everybody was out on their doorstep applauding them. And uh, I think the mood is, um, you know, is people understand what has to be done to save lives. Uh, but the the mortality rate has been quite high. The infection rate, as best as we know it, because testing is imperfect and testing has been at a low level here. Um, I, I think one serious point to make, Janine, is, is that the government did reverse its policy. I mean, the government policy here at the very beginning seemed to be to seek herd immunity, as we would call it. Uh, in other words, to, to I'm, I'm over 70 and can say this, that, that older people in a way were expendable. I mean, I, I, I'm aware that the government must have known going into this that uh, if you extrapolated the Chinese uh, infection rates and mortality rates uh, to the UK situation, that you could have had 300,000 to 500,000 deaths from this uh, terrible disease. Um, when, when about two or three weeks ago, maybe three, three weeks ago, four weeks ago, the government at a COBRA session, which is the daily or weekly uh, security session where they look at crises like this, were presented with a model that showed that 200,000 people could die uh, in the UK as a result of Corona. And they reversed their policy, having not had a lockdown policy. And I, I think when the Royal Commission or the commissions are, are commissioned to look into how the government handled the crisis, that issue is going to be a very big issue. Why was it that the British government took the view that there should be a much more relaxed way of dealing with the lockdown, that we should let this this illness spread to try and spread immunity in the way that they did. And then, of course, they reversed their policy. So uh, I think that's a serious problem that will be examined uh, in the in the years to come. Uh, and there will be an inquiry into that. And I, for one, am a little bit bemused as to why it took the government so long to, to go to lockdown, which is clearly the way that, you know, if you look at the, the countries that have dealt with this well, um, or apparently well, China obviously has, it's not, a, it's an autocracy, not a democracy, but as shut, even India, I mean, which is a democracy, shut itself down. I was talking to our Indian colleagues earlier today on a, on a webinar, and you know, to, to lock down 1.2, 1.3 billion people is quite extraordinary in the way that Prime Minister Modi has done. And and to date, managed to, I mean, they do have a, a, a respiratory uh, re reliever, a drug which helps. Temperatures have been on the high side, which seems to help. And they're worried, of course, when temperatures start to fall. So I think internationally here in the UK, you know, people are OK. Uh, they're getting a little bit stir crazy with the lockdown and they're looking forward to relaxation. Uh, but Germany, for example, is already coming coming out of it. Uh, right. The Germans are, are well organized. The Swiss, the Austrians, the Italians are starting to loosen up a bit, the Spanish. So we're seeing a general slow, uh, slow releasing. And one other point I'd make, Janine, is is that a number of our clients are very worried about a difference between North and South hemispheres that what we will see, and talking to my colleagues in India, I think the biggest issue is not how far Corona has spread as yet, or the, the deaths, I mean, even one is unacceptable. The death rate has been remarkably low so far against projections for India. It's, it's the fact that there will be a North-South divide or a developed market, and I don't call them developing markets, fast growth market divide, and that will mirror the inequality that we've seen between rich and poor in the developed nations, and we'll see internationally the developing countries, uh, the, what we call the fast growth markets, falling behind. That is a big, serious issue, uh, which Corona may 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 cause, and I think that will be top of people's minds. What might that mean for how we approach business moving forward? Does that you know, lead you to recommend anything in the way that you approach a recovery uh, from an uh, industry standpoint? Well, I think it's a really interesting question because I think what it means is that China, where we've already seen, you saw the L'Oreal results this morning. You saw uh, L, uh, where China was up 6%. You saw LVMH saying that uh, luxury sales in the last few weeks have 
recovered quite substantially and their stock responded in that way. So I think it, it does have deep implications. What it means is that China, the West of Europe, Western part of Europe, the UK and the United States will be in a relatively good position. I mean, I was on the, the call also to our colleagues in Brazil. Uh, you know, the, the, the Brazilian uh, president fired the head of Ministry of Health yesterday. Uh, and that has caused a, a lot of disquiet in many respects. So uh, I, I think what it means is you might see some sort of layering, if that's the right way of putting it, of, of the recovery, that the recovery will be stronger in places such as China, Western Europe and the US and quicker than it will be in other, other hemispheres. I, I went to bed last night, as I was send, saying to you when, in our prep session for this, uh, feeling a little bit concerned because I was on a call, doesn't matter who, who was on it and where it was, but on a call where medical experts were saying they were very worried about a resurgence of C-19 in September and October when temperatures got colder. Right. And I think, uh, I think that's a thing so that you, you know, one of our, our clients, the chairman of one of our clients said it to me, we'll see a W. Uh, here it will be W shaped, not not V shaped or L shaped. In other words, we'll have surges one way or another. I I because I want to retain a, an optimistic tone, and I think that's important. Uh, and I think nothing is impossible. I, I mean, I mentioned this on the Indian call. Uh, HBS has done a very uh, this has got a very good uh, case series of case courses on the Chilean mining disaster, uh, uh, building a course around crisis management. And uh, you may recall the 33 miners that were trapped 700 meters underground under impenetrable rock. And a 23-year-old engineer, inexperienced engineer, gave the head of uh, the, the rescue mission, who was recruited from uh, Cadelco, the state mining company, to go into this private mining company where the accident occurred, we, we, this 23-year-old engineer told the, the, the head of the crisis management team, uh, gave him an idea about technique to drill. And they drilled through and they drilled their way through, I think after day 17 of 77 days, that the miners were trapped underground. It looked like it was an impossible task, but ingenuity, listening to people, analyzing what people said, you know, what seemed impossible was uh, every one of those 33 miners was rescued. And so nothing is impossible, as they used to say at Sarches, as Morris used to say, and Charles used to say. And I think, I think that's important to bear in mind. So my view is Q2 will be a bloodbath. It will, we're going through it already. The banks are down 50% or so in terms of their earnings as they provide uh, you know, a, a stronger balance sheet and make provisions for loan losses. We'll see bad results. We've seen good results from Procter, J&J, who are uh, upping their dividends. Uh, L'Oreal, obviously, uh, optimistic this morning or more optimistic. But generally, it will be very difficult in Q2. I think we'll see a recovery from low levels in Q3. And then into Q4, it'll get better. And as we go into 2021, I think things will get better. There are things that will knock us off course. But I, I think generally, and S4 is a purely digital business. We're totally focused on that holy trinity of first party data, digital advertising content and programmatic. And we're in the sweet spot. I mean, what we are seeing at the moment, even with the cuts in advertising budgets, is shifts in money into digital. Yeah. And the digital platforms, you know, the six big ones, Google, Facebook, Amazon, Tencent, Alibaba and TikTok or ByteDance, uh, in my view, going to get stronger and stronger. They may have some problems around small businesses because that's the sector of the economy that's going to be hardest hit by these liquidity issues. But once we get through Q2 and Q3, those platforms are going to be even stronger in the future, driven by data as well. I mean, the first party data uh, is going to become more important and third party cookies have been mixed or will be nixed over the next two years by Google. They've been nixed already by Apple on their iPhones. So clients will be driven back in developing their first party data sources to the, the 
data that an Amazon has, that a Facebook has, that a Google has, that a Tencent, Alibaba and TikTok has. And just imagine the data that those platforms have managed to garner in the last few weeks. It's huge, absolutely yeah. huge. We have a few shout outs. We have uh, watching yeah. Abdul from Pakistan, German from Madrid, Marianne from Atlanta. Uh, we have Guilherme from San Pablo, Nada from Saudi Arabia, Rafael from Brazil, and Terry from Colorado. Sorry if I got any of your names wrong, but thank you for <laughs> joining us. And uh, I have a question from Toby Jarvis on Facebook. How are you persuading your clients to continue advertising, especially since people are watching TV and online more than ever? And I want to add to that question, um, should advertisers keep advertising during this time? Should marketers still be advertising right now? Well, look, listen, the, the traditional agency response is spend, spend, spend. You know, the, 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 the quote statistics. I mean, you know, I think my former colleagues are uh, uh, quoting a statistic that 84% of consumers, you know, will be watching carefully or will, uh, will appreciate those companies that uh, behave well during, well, look, everybody's going to behave well everybody right-mindedly will behave well but it's not going to it's not going to be a good thing to spend 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 that's a nonsense I and mean, when companies are facing existential crises in q2 when they are not sure that they will have enough money to survive it's ridiculous and i would put it as strongly as that to say spend 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 that's a nonsense uh, it's right to say that for example the tech companies who have budgets that were built around, say, sporting events around Tokyo 2020 or Euro 2020 or the Premier League or the IPL or wherever it happens to be, or baseball or basketball, that they should divert that spending to doing good, to the purpose-driven campaigns, but those, to purpose-driven campaigns, but those campaigns should be of highly practical, uh, altruistic purpose. They should be focused on equipment, on vaccine development, on therapy development, on supporting those on the front line in the NHS in the UK or doctors or nurses right. or what it happened to be. It, it shouldn't be self-seeking. And, and I think to suggest that spend, spend, spend is the answer is really ridiculous. So the answer to the Toby's question, I think, is that you have to encourage clients to deploy their resources more effectively in the way that I outlined and given what he says about TV audiences and in particular online audiences to divert money and push money uh, into digital. I think we've already seen that. I mean, we've got really two buckets at S4. Our revenues are running at about $400 million. About half is in tech. The tech companies up until now have held their budgets in our experience. Some actually, you know, Amazon hits a new high on the stock exchange. Netflix hits a, a new high. We are seeing uh, budgets being expanded with those companies that have been positively affected. Obviously, travel and tourism be the other end of the, the spectrum. But the tech companies are diverting money from those sporting events that I mentioned, for example, to doing good and purpose campaigns. We're also starting to see some postponement I think by tech companies from half one into half two because they can't spend all that money or those budgets and they're seeing some pressure on their own advertising revenues as the SMBs come under pressure. I think we'll see that in the platform results as we get into them in Q2 as they, they report on Q1 and talk about Q2 and beyond. We'll see the SMBs have been put under extreme pressure and they dr they drive a lot of the revenues of a Google, a Facebook, an Amazon, a Tencent, an Alibaba, and a TikTok. Jack Ma always talks about Alibaba being the platform for entrepreneurs and new business in, in a Chinese con context and the engine uh, of recovery. So I, I think what, what we're saying to clients is, you know, understand that you have to cut, move money into digital because that's more effective. Uh, I, I think we're seeing a, a heavy increase in streaming not just at Netflix, but at the competitors like a Disney Plus. You see the Disney Plus subscription figures, which are huge. One must be one of the most successful new product launches for a long period of time. You see it with Hulu. You see it with Roku. You see it with Peacock. All these streaming uh, devices, 
will put pressure on linear TV along with the switch to digital. And I think that's the, not used to be the $64,000 question uh, as to what is going to happen to linear TV. I think we see continued compression there and not quite as high. I remember I did a, a session at CES with Bill Koenigsberg of Horizon, who yeah. runs the, the most successful independent media agency in America. It's number three in the market after uh, Publicis and Omnicom in the US market. I remember him saying at, at CES that he thought some parts of the day parts would be down by 45%. That was before uh, C19. I, I think there will be continued pressure on linear TV. And that's the, again, is it going to be as bad as what happened to newspapers and magazines? No, uh, it, will be, it will be better than that. But um, I think there will be continued pressure of some, some, of some significant degree. Yeah. So those are some of the changes uh, that we're seeing. And, and just to amplify a little bit, as we come out of this, as we come into Q4 and 2021, three things are going to happen. Consumers are going to switch even faster to digital. They've learned to educate their kids, buy online, communicate with one another on social, on video, whatever it happens to be during C19, it will accelerate it. And we're going to see media owners switch to digital even faster as well. And finally, enterprise managers who were maybe hesitant to embark on digital transformation because they didn't want to disturb the status quo, given where their results are in Q2 and beyond, they'll disturb the status quo. In fact, they will get a, a, a encouraged by shareholders, uh, by their own people, to try and up the ante and change. Right. I'm Janine Poggi, and I'm here with Martin Sorrell. If you have any questions, feel free to leave them on our social channels. Uh, you know, you talked about a couple of different consumer behaviors that are changing. What are some habits that you think might stick post pandemic? Well, I, I think, I think. I, it's all change, actually. I mean, I, I'm trying to think of things that will will stick and will not and not be changed, and it's uh, a difficult one to estimate. I mean, all the changes that I can, you know, will my travel pattern be the same? I doubt it. Certainly, in the short to medium term, maybe longer term, you know, I might revert to type. I don't think so. I think the technologies that we're using, example here. Uh, some of the most sophisticated technologies, the, the classroom technologies that came out of the universities, which are now being adapted for, for conversations like this. I mean, we did a, a call with 300 of, of our people at Mighty Hive, Mighty Hive, 500 Mighty Hivers. We did a call just now with 50 people uh, on Zoom. We use Microsoft Teams, we use Google Hangout, and we use all the technologies and these technologies, we're not down, we're not as far as beam me, beam me down Scotty, we're not to that level, but who knows what will happen in terms of the use of major technologies. So I think that will change. I think, I think working from home, you know, we've already seen with our people, average age of the people at Mighty Hub is about 25. They've already raised the question as to why is it that we spend seven, eight, nine percent of our revenues uh, and spend being the operative word on office properties. Right. Surely, I mean, one guy wrote to me and said he's been working at, uh, I think it was Mighty High for two and a half years, has never really gone into the office. Why are we investing? Why don't we redeploy that a, ma a majority of that six or seven percent? I mean, in our case, $400 million, which 60% is invested in people, so it's about a quarter of a billion dollars. About 30, 35 million dollars is invested in property. Why don't we shift that into investing in people? And it's a very good point. So I think, Janine, there are, there are things, you know, I think retail space. Yeah. I mean, clients are going to say, why are we spending so much money on retail space? When you look at, you know, Diageo says it's cutting its ad spend. You know, non-essential ad spend, as it described it. At the same time, it says, I think it's called Saucy in Los Angeles, is online delivery of uh, of drinks, uh, etc. And that's that's exploding in terms of growth. So clients are going to shift. They're going to talk about using or deploying resources in a different way. So I'm not sure how much right. is actually not going to change. I think it's 
what we're going to see is an acceleration. I mean, in a way, you could say that the trends that we saw before, the shift to digital, the shift from traditional media to new media, the shift with consumers to new media devices, the shift of, to digital transformation will remain the same, but grow faster. I mean, I suppose you could put it that, that right. way. But but I, I can't think of much that yeah. this has been such a shattering experience for so many people that I think we're going to see significant behavioral change or acceleration of those trends that we've seen. It'll be interesting even to see when people will feel comfortable traveling again, when they'll feel comfortable uh, attending large gatherings and, you know, a lot of the events business will rely on those things as well. Well, you know, can I, I'm told I was told by a client today that can is re-examining or examining the possibilities of a virtual can. And if they are, uh, I would encourage them to do that because I think that's the sort of event that we should rethink at this particular point in time. But but, you know, just think about it this way. You know, after 9-11, uh, obviously, people thought about office buildings, high office buildings. They thought about travel. They thought about being on airplanes and everything. And we adapted to it. And we, we go through an airport now and we're searched and we go through security. You know, I can see the same thing happening right. post C-19. We go into an office building. You won't be asked for your identity or your passport. You'll be asked to take a temperature check. Yeah. You'll be asked to produce an app, you know, they already have it in China, where the, if you're red and yellow, you're not allowed into the restaurant. If you're green, you're good to go. Testing, you know, here in the UK, you asked me about the UK, testing in the UK uh, is still at a very low level. In Germany, one of the reasons the Germans are out of it, or appear to be out of it faster, is their testing levels were, mu were much higher. So clearly, we will adapt our behavior uh, to change circumstances. And it may become normal, yeah. maybe a bad thing for us to go in and take a temperature check, for us to produce an app saying that we're healthy. And, you know, when you think about it for a minute, it can be applied to other other problems, other health problems that we have. So yeah. we're, we're seeing an adaptation. That's why to come back to the, the V shape rather than the W or the Ls, uh, I'm very optimistic about the, the ability of technology to change and the ability of the pharma companies to change. I mean, what I've seen at, at close hand in the last few weeks has amazed me in terms of the responsiveness. You know, we've seen more coordination between companies than we have seen between governments. I mean, the sad thing about this crisis, as opposed to 2008, that it took a bit more longer to it was a it was a slower burn. This has been at warp speed, but we saw more uh, so cooperation between the G20 or the G7. To date, uh, on C19, we've seen no cooperation, and that's the problem. You know, we're we're all focused on our own country, our own nationality, and we haven't we we've lost that sense of community across the globe. Are there any lessons or takeaways um, from, you know, weathering the storm when you were at WPP at not during 9-11 or, you know, 2008 recession that can be applied here? I, I don't think so. I think 9-11, um, I you know, everybody says this is unprecedented. It is. Maybe the precedent is war. It's not like 9-11. Uh, uh, it's not like 2008. It's not like 2001, two, dot com bu bubble burst it's not like 91 92 or nobody on this w w on this this line will know what i'm talking about when i talk about the oil price crisis in the in the 70s and the 80s of the previous millennium um no it's not like this this is this is totally different so uh, what i would say is I, I think that the holding company's reactions now uh, you know one of the things i would say and this may be harsh but i'll say it you know, to, to fire 10% of your workforce uh, or 15% or whatever it is, because you think your revenues are going to fall by 10 or 15% is not the answer. I mean, I, I'm witnessing some behavior now, uh, which has already started happening in the last 48, 72 hours, where, which I think is not right. I mean, what's happening is people at the center are starting to issue edicts. And this is something that I think was 
sort of holding company behavior, they're starting to issue edicts from the center, having built up considerable overhead at the center over the years. I mean, if you, I, I won't go into the specifics, but I think one case where they've invested very heavily in new business at the center, in human resources, in IT, they've got hordes of people at the center, which duplicate what the operating brands are on. And what, what are they doing? They're saying to the operating brands, you have to take out people. And it's, you know, it's a, maybe a difficult analogy, but it's sort of like saying the National Health Service should take out doctors or should take out nurses. Those are the people on the front line and the holding companies are taking out people on the front line who interface with clients, who are good with clients and have done a good job and getting the balance right. So I, I don't think there are lessons. This is very different. This is not a financial crisis. This is a general crisis. This is a healthcare crisis, a financial crisis, a logistics crisis, a supply chain crisis. It covers everything. And that's yeah. why the, the Chinese mining accident I think uh, or that that crisis is probably the best analogy because you know it was impossible people thought to drive through that 700 meters of rock. What what might you think are um, you know some of the agencies who might be best equipped to you know come out of this okay? Well, yeah, that's a leading question. I'm obviously <laughs> going to talk my own book, and I would say we would, uh, you know. S4 is purely digital, so we're we're going with the flow. It's focused on that that holy trinity, as we call it, that troika of first party data, which is going to become more and more important because of the mixing of third party cookies, driving the development of digital advertising content and programmatic. We're faster, better, cheaper. That's our mantra. Faster means agility, which is the key attribute. Uh, resilience, we were talking about resilience being important, that's important, but uh, really agility and speed is the key attribute. Better means understanding 16 companies in the digital ecosystem uh, as well as anybody else and better. And cheaper means not ZBB, not zero-based budgeting, but being efficient. And then the last attribute is a unitary structure. All of the six hold codes are trying to become one firm, some faster than others. But essentially, they're trying to do that. We started with a clean sheet of paper. We're building a unitary firm where everybody participates, and it genuinely is one PL. It's not BS. And we try and operate as seamlessly as possible. So far, we've built our content pillar around media months. We've added six bit in what is it? In 18 months, 21 months, we've become, we still are uh, a, a, a dollar unicorn, a, a billion dollar market cap unicorn. And we've done that in all credit to our people, our two and a half thousand people in 30 countries, done that in uh, 21 months or whatever it is. But we built the content pillar around media months and the programmatic media data and analytics pillar around Mighty Hive. And we have 2,000 monks and 500 Mighty Hivers. And we're bringing those two functions together. We're building a strategic unit between the two. We're building a data and analytics pl platform underneath them. And we're, we're going after enterprise business in content, enterprise business in digital media, and SMB and independent agency business as well. So it's a strong, uh, I think a strong offer and much more attuned to the, this this modern day, either pre pre COVID or post. And so the answer to your question is, you know, all companies that really adapt adopt that way. I think it's very difficult for traditional analog companies to embrace the degree of change that is necessary. And you know, if you look at the listed sector and all the six hold codes are listed companies, maybe you put Vivendi to one side for a minute, because you know, it has a, at its head, uh, Vincent Bolloré, who's probably of all the holding company owners, the most astute, I would say, and the, the most dangerous, I would say. So I'd, well, he has 3 billion euros in his pocket, having sold 10% of Universal to uh, Tencent, and with a potentially another 3 billion. I will watch very carefully what his next move was. Um, yeah, as Habas buried in Vivendi, but putting them to one side, the other five 
are really listed companies that are uncontrolled uh, with managers running them and they're vulnerable yeah. and uh, they're vulnerable because of their traditional base and they're vulnerable because of the pressure put under them by COVID. I, I think the only way they can really develop an answer is that they go private or get broken up. And, and, and the old model, which I was heavily involved in, of building market share with competing brands is now gone. What you have to do is to build a single unit. You can't go to, you know, WPP for, from my perspective, and I'm still a major shareholder in WPP, uh, has become more vertical and less horizontal. They talk horizontal, but effectively they've become more like Omnicom, which is very vert vertical rather than um, moving towards the one firm, which I think everybody in the industry is trying to trying to do. Right. This is Virtual Pages. I am Janine Poggi here at AdAge with Sir Martin Searle. Uh, you know, you mentioned at the top of this, you know, of course, there are no more breakfast meetings, lunch meetings. You're not traveling, <laughs> of course, anywhere. You know, coming out of this, is this changing perhaps what you think about of how you work or run a business, you know, post pandemic? What new routines might you adopt from this or what new habits might you, you know, take with you once this is over? No, I think I think it does. I mean, I'm, I'm in a, a fortunate position because I have enough space. I think we see it uh, with our people. The average age of people at uh, Mighty Hive is about 25, at Me Monks about 33. Uh, and we see, you know, when you have two income earners in a family or you have kids as well, it's put people under pressure. But, you know, I think probably it, it drives you to think a, li a little bit more about working from home uh, more effectively. Uh, obviously, the flip side of that is you reduce your investment in property, whether it's retail uh, or, or office. I've talked to some property consultants already, real estate uh, people already, who are already looking at how clients are already adapting, actually, uh, as to how clients can reduce their investment uh, in office space. WeWorks, you know, for all its faults, actually understood that. Adam Newman understood that. The flexibility was important. If you're running an agency, you win a piece of business, you want to add property. You lose a piece of business, you want to take it out. And of course, fixed leases for three years, five years, seven years, 10 years, obviously gravitated against that. So that's one thing. Travel, I will reassess. Uh, the use of online communication, I will reassess. I, I mean, again, one of the positives that have come out of this, you know, we formed uh, what we call the CCG, a coronavirus crisis group, eight of us who meet every day to look at what's happening to our people, look at what's happening with our clients, look at what's happening to our finances and any other matters. Uh, we have calls now with, with everybody. We're over communicating in order to make everybody feel as they know, not feel, know that what, what's going on the communicating rate, it's drawn us much more together. And that's been one of the hidden benefits, if you like, <clears throat> of this. Out of every crisis, you know, Chinese characters for crisis uh, indicate or can also be used for opportunity. And, and there are some opportunities that come out of this. So I think communication is going to be different. There will be less, you know, somebody said to me, do you think deals can be done without handshakes? And the answer is probably not, but a lot of the communication in future will be more effectively done uh, in, in this sort of way. And, and the technology will become more sophisticated. They'll, everybody, Zoom goes from 10 million users to 200 million users. It has problems as a result, but to be fair, who wouldn't? If an agency went from 10 million of revenue to 200 million of revenue, in a nanosecond, you'd have problems too. So, you know, don't shoot them. Don't shoot the messenger in a way. Um, so these things are happening again at warp speed. So you have to accommodate and develop. So I think the technology will improve. My travel schedule is going to change as a result of this. Can, can again, come back to can. That should change. It, it really should. And we're, I mean, we, we were on a call today talking about our clients in our CCG. And it's amazing what clients are doing already in changing what were live events into streamed events, online events, huge implications. You know, I mean, uh, 
Informa, a major, one of our non-executive directors is on the board of Informa. Informa did a, a, an ec equity issue this morning, you know, to get more liquidity. But, you know, you take a, essential, right? You know, a significant amount of its profitability came from CAN and from other, other events. Those are businesses that are going to have to change their models uh, very quickly, actually, and are going to have to adapt because I think consumer behavior is going to be different. I just, you know, one other good example of it, you know, Alan Jove at Unilever uh, said that, you know, when he was running China, uh, that after SARS, which I suppose is one of the comparisons to, to what we're seeing. I mean, anybody, just aside, everybody should read John Barry's book on the flu influenza of 1918. I mean, if you want to understand, or watch Contagion, I think probably that's <laughs> equally e e e e e e e good. But Alan Jeff said after SARS, what they noticed was this it was massive surge uh, amongst Chinese consumers to, to use online shopping and online purchasing. So that's going to be another big wave that comes through. The Nike example, you know, giving the app away for free whilst Chinese were in lockdown, massive surge as a result. These are big lessons, and I think behavior will change as a result. Yes. Thank you, Martin, for joining us. Thank you for everyone for Thank watching you, this virtual pages. And uh, Martin, be well, and we'll talk soon. And thank you for the opportunity. And anybody wants to email me with any question, martin at s4capital.com. I'm very happy to try and answer any questions. Thank you. Enjoy the weekend. Thank you, Janine. Keep, stay healthy and safe, Janine. Thank you. Bye.